What's up, everybody? Thanks, as always, for supporting the show. It would mean a lot to me if you would take a second to scroll down and hit that subscribe button to the Hoops Tonight YouTube channel, and then follow me on social media on TikTok, Instagram, and Twitter so you guys don't miss any of our content over the course of this season. All right, let's talk some basketball. Moving on to Cleveland. Where do they go from here? There was a report released from The Athletic immediately after the game. A couple of interesting kind of like tidbits in there. First of all, there's growing optimism around the league that Mitchell might extend. Thought that was interesting because there's been a lot of narrative-based stuff about him, uh, about him wanting to leave. I don't think you can take that to the bank necessarily, but that's somewhat encouraging if you're a Cavs fan, right? But then it immediately got kind of counteracted by this report from Darius Garland, who uh, is with Clutch Sports, excuse me, that uh, some of his production has gone down since the Mitchell trade. And that if Cleveland extends Donovan Mitchell, that he may want to trade. And so the point is, is they're definitely, it's looking more and more like they're going to need to choose between one of those two guys. Now, I want to kind of talk about the roster build in general first, before we talk about some specific, uh, some specific kind of strategy stuff for them going into the off season. So we knew going into this year, it's kind of a similar type of problem that the Lakers had where they have got some redundancies, right? The Lakers have two skill guards and they have two power forwards playing at the three and four, right? And so there's some diminishing returns because it's like all of a sudden you don't have a forward that can guard on the perimeter. So now Rui's chasing Michael Porter Jr. around. That's a disaster. It was one of the big factors that cost him a series. You have two skill guards, no real athletes. So you get inconsistent play from both of them. And then Austin Reeves is forced to guard Jamal Murray all series, which is something that hurt them, especially at the end of games, right? So like when you have diminishing returns because of redundant, or when you have redundancies in your roster, you tend to get diminishing returns. Cavs kind of have a similar type of situation, right? Two interior-based bigs that play at the same time, and then two ball-dominant pick-and-roll guards, neither of which is particularly big, and neither of which is particularly committed to the point of attack defensively. And so there can be some redundancy. There can be some diminishing returns there. Now, I want to focus on each of them individually. So first of all, the two-guard build. I actually grew more optimistic about it this year just because of Donovan Mitchell's defense. I thought he had the best defensive season of his career. But when they got to the playoffs, Donovan Donovan's workload went up such a huge level that it kind of became untenable to ask him to continue to do the athletic guard stuff defensively while also carrying everything he was carrying offensively. And Donovan did not have as good of a defensive postseason as he did in the regular season, particularly in help. He got burned uh, quite frequently, right? So like... I do think that when you really kind of take a second to to decompress and look back at this season, it's just a lot to ask for those two guards to kind of mesh in the right way. And so I do believe that that's probably the direction that you have to go is splitting up the two guard build. Also, I think Max Struess, because of his uh, kind of his willingness to play off the ball offensively is kind of like an off screen threat and as a spot up threat. And then a uh, Struess is just a, is just completely committed to the defensive end in terms of like he will he will give you high motor effort there at the point of attack all se- all season right so i actually think of Struess more as a 2 next to Garland or Mitchell whichever one you end up keeping and i look at the 3 as the position you want to upgrade and try to find a starting caliber two-way player there right you got to base the decision based on what Donovan Mitchell wants cuz Donovan Mitchell is a better player than Darius Garland i like Darius Garland i don't think he has too much of a of a of a ceiling that's going to be super super encouraging, right? So if Mitchell extends, I think you look to trade Garland for a starting caliber three. If Mitchell doesn't extend, then I would trade Donovan Mitchell and keep and commit to Darius Garland, right? Now the interesting thing there is which one of those guys commits. If it ends up being Mitchell wants to trade and you keep Garland, I think you have to look for more of a high-powered, offensive-minded forward. That's where it might be worthwhile, especially with Evan Mobley's defensive versatility and his ability to to compete on the perimeter, to look more of, at some of the offensive guys. Like, maybe you do look for a guy like a, a Laurie Markkinen, right? Like, maybe you do look for a a more of like a uh, uh, an offensive threat at that position, right? Maybe a Kyle Kuzma or something like that, right? But if it's Mitchell that you keep, and you end up trading Garland, Mitchell's such a high-powered offensive player, I'd be looking for more of a two-way threat at the three. That's where I'd be looking more at like a Mikhail Bridges. Maybe you call Brooklyn, and you try to see if you can trade Darius Garland for a guy like Mikhail Bridges, right? Like that. That's kind of the, the, the tipping point there is, I don't think Garland is high-powered enough offensively for you not to have a scoring forward next to him. Mitchell, I think, can play with more of like a versatile two-way Swiss Army knife type of forward because of the impact that he has offensively as far as the two bigs looks 
the look goes. Mobley's offensive development isn't where you want it to be at this point, but it is coming along little by little, and he did make progress this year. Also, like he's just not big enough to be a full-time center. And so the way I look at it, the athletic and size and rebounding advantages that come from the Mobley-Allen front court exceed the downsides of some of their offensive limitations. And Mobley will continue to get better over the years. And so when I look at like the core build of Cleveland, I think of it as whichever one of the two guards you keep, Struess at the two, I'd stick with Mobley Allen and just try to upgrade that three spot depending on which one of the two guards that you end up getting.